All right. Hi, everybody. So I realize that I'm standing between you and unlimited beer, but please don't think about that for the next hour. My name is Robert Sell, and I'll be talking about uh, insider threat and uh, what that means to your organization. And the inspiration of this talk for me was that a lot of companies that I see are just not doing that well. I realize that yours and mine are, are probably doing it fine, but there's a lot of companies out there that are simply not. So the intent of this presentation is really to kind of give you some insights and some tools to, and some, some things to think about as you go forward with companies to help them improve with their insider threat and, uh, and hopefully uh, make them uh, more safe. So before I get started, just a little bit about myself. So my life is basically comprised of three main buckets. The first one is I'm the founder and president of Trace Labs. If you haven't heard of Trace Labs, we'll be in uh, Vegas, uh, DEF CON next. We do uh, open source intelligence to help find missing persons. We do CTFs of that nature. So these are non-theoretical. We're looking for real missing persons and we generate the, all the data that we collect from that goes to law enforcement to help them find missing persons. So if you're interested in that sort of thing, check out the website there. We're always looking for more contestants or volunteers to help with our organization. Uh, also, I'm in search and rescue. Uh, why do I mention that? Well, it is kind of related. I do a lot of tracking. So if you're lost on the west coast of Canada, I may be the one looking for you. And that kind of directly ties in with the OSINT work that I do as well. Uh, I find the two are uh, very, very similar and related. And then finally, my work in information security and IT. So I've been doing that like forever. We were telling stories last night and I was talking about Sun Solaris and stuff like that, which made me realize how old I am, which is kind of sad. So, uh, so those are my three main buckets. And insider threat um, is, is a big area for me in, in kind of all of those in, in a special way. So it's, it's a subject to me that's, that's um, quite important. Quick disclaimer, standard stuff. So I have a lot of ideas. Not all of those are good. All of these opinions are just my own, not anyone else's. Some of this data changes quite quickly as well. So if there's a mistake or this technique or tool doesn't work anymore, please tell me while we're drinking beers and that will help me as well. And also if you have other insights uh, into insider threat um, that, that I haven't talked about as well, I'd love to hear that from you. So today's journey is gonna be a, a few different steps, five different steps. And step one is really to understand what, uh, what we're talking about when we say, insider threat, like what, what is that actually about? Because there's a bunch of nuances there. It's not as simple as just espionage and things like that, although that is a big component. There's different levels, and I think it's very important to understand those levels so that we can take appropriate action. Step two is to prevent how do we stop these bad things from happening. And then if they do happen, which they are, how do we detect that? And then how do we respond? And ultimately at the very end, what kind of strategy can you then implement? So at the end, I want to give you something that you can then take and then apply. So let's start off with understand. And to understand, we usually start off with a definition. And they're always terrible. I always like to pick apart definitions because uh, just, they're just so bad, generally. I don't, I don't know why our industry makes bad definitions, but maybe I'm just overly critical. But, um, you know, it's, it's not always just exploiting some sort of vulnerability that a bad actor finds with the intent to cause harm. All that, it, th that is something that happens. I find it's usually the, the, the insider has some potential and it's either authorized access they have access to or uh, an understanding of the, of the organization. I think those two pieces are, are important. But also it could be either malicious or complacent or also unintentional, completely un unintentional. And so I'll talk about a big part of that. I think that's something to consider. We often think about insider threat as uh, the bad guy who is just waiting to cause harm, and that's not necessarily the case. So why is this important? Why do we care? Well, I just threw some numbers up here, and these numbers are growing all the time, and these are about a year old now, right? So they're gonna be bigger. But if we just look at a few of them, 2,500 uh, internal security breaches in the U.S. daily. Uh, that's pretty big. That's going up. That's just the U.S. 34% of businesses around the globe are infected uh, yearly. Then we have the last two years, it's increased about almost 50%. That's huge. 
And then the average cost has gone up 31%. And you can look, those are, those are in their millions. So I like, to, I like to think about that in regards to stocks. If those were stocks and those were the returns, you'd buy them, right? So I think it's a fairly significant and important subject to, to understand and to make part of our strategy. And if that wasn't reason enough to think about this with your organization, this is really interesting. So if you have time one day, take a look at this if you're not already familiar with it. So not only is insider threat in general increasing, costly, uh, very, very popular, but also now we have nation states that are changing the way that things operate. So as of 2017, you can read Article 14, you know, where the, the Chinese government has said, well, basically we can take any person or any organization and turn them into a spy. Well, Rob, how's that different from the rest of the world? Well, I, I think that there is historically not been uh, so much activity like that, and this really changes the game in how we operate. And I think it's a very dangerous change. So take a look at that. I'm going to get into the nuances of insider threat today, uh, because like I said, it's not all the same. It's not all just the bad guy, the cloak and dagger. There's also uh, a lot of kind of uh, less intentful uh, or less um, uh, skill set of people there as well, right? So I'm going to go through the different categories, the different types, whether they have intent, whether they were triggered, right? So were these people uh, kind of conditioned within your company to then go and do bad things? And the answer is yes, right? As we can see here. And the levels of sophistication as well. So I think that's very important. So to start off, we're going to talk about pawns. These are the people that um, often are innocent. They didn't mean to do it. These are the people that click the link, that open the attachment over and over again. Uh, I often think about these people as having high charisma, but low wisdom. And they're, they're very you know, sorry that they did it when they make the mistake and you make them aware of it. They're like, oh, I'm so sorry. I'll never do it again. And then that's, yes, they will. Um, they regret what they did. They, they, they really, sometimes it will have a huge emotional impact on them. Uh, and they're, they're just, the pawns is an appropriate word, right? Because they're really being used by usually an outside attacker. And sometimes the other side of that will be maybe they're just a little bit lazy and they don't really want to follow the policy. Um, either way, their intent is not really to damage the organization so much as just you know, they, they click the link because they thought it was the right thing or they just don't care. So um, there's always usually a trigger event with this as well, right? So this is something that's happening within the organization where they're doing something and they're making themselves an insider threat. And this could be mitigated fairly easy, which I'm going to get into later as well. But that's something to think about, right? This is an internal trigger. So within the pawns category, we have the accidental. So those are the people that are very innocent. They click the link. Uh, it's a phishing link or an email, or maybe someone phones them and is posing as an administrator or something like that. So these are uh, the, the innocent. There's no intent there at all. An example of that is uh, the Twitter hack. This was not too long ago. I think it's a couple of years ago now, maybe. Uh, there was several components to this, but one of the components was uh, the hackers posing as the administrators of Twitter to simply get to some creds and, and move to the next level. So maybe not the best example, but I thought this was, everybody will be familiar with this one. So that's an example of, of that. The next sort of category of, uh, or the next type of pawns is the lazy. And so very similar, these are not necessarily so innocent, they just don't really care. They don't want to follow the policy, um, they're, they're lazy that way, they, they don't really feel too much remorse, so they may not say sorry so many times. Um, they're not really interested in greed, which is interesting, they just don't, they just want work avoidance basically, they just don't want to go through all the hassle. Um, they're not really interested in uh, any additional effort. So an example of that might be just leaves the laptop open at the airport. They don't care who sees it, or maybe it's the paper that they leave somewhere. They're not follows, following the uh, disposal processes uh, and policies, right, like other people would. So, and I see this all the time. Um, people just don't care. And this especially happens if you let it. So if a company doesn't do something about this behavior, it will just continue and get worse, right? Um, oops, what did I do? 
Uh, here we go. An example of this, um, I had to use this example, right? It just, I thought it was incredible. So this is a, an employee, one of the supercomputers in Russia, probably not fully utilized. So he's like, well, I'll just m mine some Bitcoin. And uh, so the FSB picked him up and uh, he's probably having a bad day right now. But um, it's an example of that. Just doesn't care. Right? He's like, well, I'll mine some Bitcoin. I got some extra capacity here. The next category is turn cloaks. So while pawns are kind of victims and we feel sorry for them, uh, turn cloaks are, are not, right? So they have a purpose and an intent and uh, they'll show some remorse sometimes, but not usually, right? Like they're out to do something and um, they won't necessarily change their habits if you give them additional training and things like that. They really have a mission. So, but there is usually a trigger that happens within the organization that is, that is creating that, that type of activity, right? So there's opportunities here as well to curb this and to defend against this. So one type of turn cloak is the career turn cloak. And going through my, my uh, career in IT and security, I used to see this all the time. People come up and I'm going to date myself again but they would come up to me and they'd say, oh, Rob, do you have some blank CDs or blank DVDs? And now it's, you know, hey, do you have a USB key I can have? It's like, why? And they're loading that up with data because they're gonna leave the organization in a week or two. And so we see this all the time. And I think this, if you're looking for opportunities in your organization to, to reduce IP leakage, I mean, this is a great one. I, I, we still are so terrible at this, right? Um, so no intent to cause harm, they just don't care. They want all their data and they're gonna probably take all the pr other project data that they can access and stuff like that. Your DLP systems may help a little bit with that, but um, yeah, this happens all the time. Um, just motivated by that desire to keep all of their creative content. So they may be ignorant of the rules and if you confront them um, quite often, they plead ignorance, um, but they, at the end of the day, they just generally don't care and they'll do it if they can. So typical, typical scenarios is exfiltrating their data. Uh, portable media used to be the go-to thing, but now, of course, with cloud and stuff like that, they can just put it online. So that's something to watch out for. And um, oops, I go the wrong way all the time with this. So my favorite example of this, this is just crazy, is um, the Google Insider threat, where the guy's working at Google, and uh, they're, they're developing self-driving program here for self-driving cars and stuff like that. On the way out the door, he's like, well, I'll just take all this data with me. And, um, and then starts his own company with that data. So crazy, goes to jail. Um, yeah, just amazing. But this is like the, the uh, classic example of that or the extreme example of that rather. But this happens at a, as, at a less extreme level every day. So the next type of turn cloak is uh, disgruntled. And I think this is another one that I would focus on, right? Because we have a great opportunity for change with this type of insider threat. This is the person that's disgruntled. This, this person has been pissed off, right? Basically, you have not treated them well um, or, or there's been something that's been triggered that's caused them to be that way. And um, they have an intent to cause harm and they will. Uh, their likelihood of success is very high, even if that is simply to cause disruptions in the workforce and things like that. Uh, ransomware, uh, discouraging other employees, bringing down morale. Uh, you just need a couple of these people and it's not going to be good, right? So at least productivity can go down, but they could also do things like introducing ransomware and, and things like that. And that, this, this actually happens quite a bit, right? So I think there's a great opportunity with this one. An example of this is, you know, don't, don't piss off your sysadmin when they know all the uh, passwords to all your routers, right? So this person changed those and basically shut down this company for a while. And that was a, a bad day for everyone. More than $800,000 in damages, not good. So this happens a lot as well. Which brings me finally to imposters. So while pawns are accidental and turn cloaks have intent, as we saw, right? The uh, imposters are sophisticated. So these are the people that could be in your company uh, pulling all your IP and you wouldn't necessarily know about it uh, ever. 
uh, and then you see some other company start and now they've got a competitive advantage and, and things like that. So these are super, super harmful for a creative company. And, and one of the things I, I think about a lot when I was developing this talk was how unfortunate that is. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion around how a lot of companies, especially in Silicon Valley and, and places like that, have lost all their IP due to this phenomenon, right? And there's no need for it, really. So this is uh, not emotional for these people. This is a business, typically, and that's good to know because anything that's run like a business, you can know kind of how they're going to operate. So if you make it painful and expensive for them to get your IP, they may move on to another company that's softer and easier, right? So unlike, however, the turn cloaks and the pawns, there's no real trigger here. You're not pissing them off or irritating them or doing something or not giving them enough training necessarily. They're there as a business to take your IP. I went the wrong way again. Okay. Um, so the first type of imposter is malicious, right? These are the people that are really want to do harm to your organization one way or another. So there's no remorse. They don't really care. Um, unlike the disgruntled, malicious wasn't triggered. And I kind of, since I created this, I've kind of gone back and forth on this. I think there is, to some degree, it could be a trigger, depending on the nature of your organization. And my example, which I'll show you in a minute, I think was partly triggered. We could debate over beers later. Um, they know the rules. Um, and they know how not to get caught, basically, right? So they're going to do something. This an example of this could be whistleblowing or actual sabotage. We've seen that. So my example is Snowden, and I know that's going to have mixed reactions from, from people. For me as well, some days I think he's a, a hero, some days I think he's not. But his boss definitely doesn't think he is, right? And so from his boss's opinion, and then the agency, of course, um, they view him as malicious, right? Uh, and to some degree, that, that's, that's true from their perspective, of course, right? So that's an example of that. The next type of imposter is the pirates. These are really interesting because they're fully intent on finding opportunities uh, to profit. That's what it's all about. These are the hand solos, right, of, uh, of the uh, imposters. And no remorse, obviously, right? This is a business. That's their, their, their MO. They know the rules. They've probably been in your company a long time. They know how it works. They're going to spend a lot of time because there's a lot of money probably involved. They could spend a lot of time going through and understanding your defenses. They may work there, of course, um, motivated, motivated by personal gain, monetary rewards, of course, right? And um, they're not interested in your compliance training or your policies or becoming friends um, or anything like that. So typical scenario could be ransomware could be credentials or just your corporate data, right? Your IP. Um, this example I really like because for, for multiple reasons. One is it's a great story. So if you're not familiar with this story, this was a Tesla employee. One moment. This was a Tesla employee who uh, was out for beers like we're gonna do later. And um, his friend came up to him and said, hey, I'll give you half a million dollars if you plant this malware in Tesla. And uh, I think he kind of went along with it for a little while. Maybe he was thinking about it. I don't know, half a million dollars, right? That's a lot of money. And uh, he actually reported it. So he gave up half a million dollars. Yeah, of course, there was some risk involved there. Of course, he would, be, would become a criminal and he could go to jail. But half a million dollars is a pretty big incentive. And, and he went and reported it and these people got caught. So that tells you something about the, the corporate culture there, right? And, and his, uh, how he valued his job and what he was doing there uh, because he wasn't uh, swayed by that half a million. And so I think that I'm not too familiar with, with Tesla. If anybody works there and has insights into that, I'd love to hear about that. But I think that there's something to learn from that. And, and I'm gonna talk about that later because uh, that could have gone either way, right? The next imposter is of course espionage. And um, this is the one that's, I think, that we all think about when we think about insider threat. And, uh, and this is the, uh, the movies are about this, of course, and things like this. And, you know, these are the people that are fully intent on their mission, also very kind of business-like, no remorse, of course. They're, they're employed to in infiltrate your company um, and move that data, usually it's IP, to a, a foreign country, right? 
and uh, data exfiltration uh, without ever you knowing that it was lost as well, right? I think that's the trick here. Um, it's a more graceful and sophisticated operation typically. And uh, if you're a large company with IP, then uh, this would be a, a primary concern. Example of that, I mean, this is a classic examples and there, there's, there's tons of these out there where you have, an, uh, usually it's an employee and uh, they're just siphoning data uh, one way or another, multiple ways to do this, and they're sending it back to, uh, to a, the, the home country. Uh, and we see this quite a bit. I mean, this is uh, aerospace. We see that a lot in that sector, of course. And, uh, but it can happen anywhere where you have important, valuable data. And there was some statistics on this, and I have to put that in the next uh, version of this, I think. But it's, it's a very high number of how often this happens. So we've gone through that and seen now the different types, right? The different categories and types and the intent and the triggered. So you can start to see some patterns here, right? You can see that the pawns are kind of triggered. There's, there's things that are happening in your organization that's causing them to click on the links or to uh, open the attachments or to give their credentials. And the turn cloaks, the career ones, right? They're, they're able to copy that data and move that data. And the, the disgruntled, they're able to cause issues and we're not discovering that they're disgruntled and that that's why they're doing these things, right? They're, they're, there's, there's reasons behind that. And the imposters, of course, they're, they're fully intent on causing damage, but there's no internal things going on there. There's nothing we could perhaps do from a culture, corporate culture perspective that would necessarily change that, right? So I think this gives us a good overview of, of what that insider threat landscape looks like. So now we can start to th think about our strategy to move forward. So how do we prevent these things from happening? And we can look at each one of these three categories in sequence, right? So for pawns, you know, there's a huge emphasis on training, user awareness training. When we think about things like our receptionist, right? How much training does that person get? Probably none, maybe a little bit, but, but not a lot. Uh, so there's all sorts of training programs that you can do, and I know what you're probably thinking, well, yeah, we have training programs, we, we do mandatory training and stuff like that, but most of the time it's just click through. It's like, oh yeah, I could do that in five minutes, bang, 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 and it's done, and employees don't get much out of it. I would encourage people to gamify this, to make it interesting, to make it fun, to make it something that people actually learn from, because most of the time they don't. Other things you can do is security champion programs, right? Where you're actually rewarding employees for doing great jobs. So if they detect malware or they detect a phishing attempt, instead of just keeping stats, actually make them, turn them into a champion, make a big deal about it. So other people wanna do that and get that recognition. So there's a huge emphasis on that. These are fairly easy things to do. The see something, say something program. So if people are seeing weird behavior, are they reporting that to their manager or maybe anonymously, right? Things like that. And we start to see a little bit of management activity and technical controls for the pawns, but not a lot. Like a lot of this is just kind of like soft skill stuff, right? There's not a lot of technical controls improvements there. Start to move to turn cloaks, right? We start to see a little bit more of an even response. We still are adding more training, more corporate culture type of activity, right? So employee engagement programs, how engaged are your employees? So when they become disgruntled because they didn't get that promotion and things like that, are we actually looking at that and paying attention to it, right? Are we seeing the change in behavior? I think that's really important and that can really help with uh, getting rid of some of that risk. So open dialogue on security. Uh, I find that there's a lot of discussion in security. We say, oh, security is everybody's job. Well, no, it's not. Like if you ask someone in marketing, is security your job? They'll say no. Right, so they're not getting paid the same. They're not, it's not their priority, but we can help with that in various techniques, right? By making it interesting for them, by trying to make it their priority, by uh, doing all these different things, gamifying it, giving out prizes, making champions out of people in the company. And then we're starting to get into more technical controls. So we're looking at more DLP, uh, denying portable media, that may not be possible for you, but we're looking at how is that data leaving the company? and trying to regulate that. No BYOD, some places that's possible. And now finally we're getting into imposters, right? And now there's much more emphasis on technical controls. Still some, some stuff at the top there, some of those softer stuff, right? Corporate culture, really looking at that protectionism culture. And I keep mentioning that, I really think that's one of the secrets here 
is taking a look at the, the overall culture. So are people really proud to work there? Are people going to stop others from just drafting through the front door? Things like that um, that we really want to look at. And I would go as far as looking at really creative ways to solve this problem, right? So when we look at visible activity as far as the SOC or even CCTV, what would happen if you were to show the CCTV activity to everyone, right? So if everybody could see that in real time and report any weird stuff going on. I'm not advocating that you necessarily have to do that, but creative ways to solve this problem. And then adding more technical controls. So tamper-proof card access. How many people have tamper-proof engaged on their card access? I bet not too many, right? So fairly easy to mess with that sort of stuff. I'm a huge fan of micro-segmentation, especially with software-defined networks. Uh, I find that when we're looking at access to different areas, that's a great tool. And then finally, we can move into detection. So how do we actually start to detect these threats if they're in? And they are, right? So the two kind of ways that we look at this is from a tools perspective, of course, right? So typical information security tools, we can look at that. And then we can also look at behavior. So we can identify insider threat IOCs. And, um, you know, in an ideal world, there would be this holistic mix of both of their, those, and we would bring them together. However, a lot of companies, they don't have sufficient staff, even for information security alone, let, let alone insider threat detection, right? They definitely don't have a, an anti-espionage team, right, that's, that's usually working. It's very rare that I, I, I see that. So how do we solve that problem? And I would go back again to corporate culture, right? So when we look at um, scale, we need to be able to scale our security teams. And how do we do that? We need to utilize people in the company, but it's not their job. So how do we make it their job? So I, I would encourage some sort of reporting system where you can get a heads up of any sort of strange activity, but then you need to encourage that. You need to reward that. And it needs to be a system that works, right? So it's either up through management or it's some sort of anonymous reporting. Some indicators of compromise, which I recommend at a management level. Uh, you know, I think that management sh should be familiar with these things and, and thinking about these things. Often we're not, right? So when someone's passed over for, for a promotion at a management level, how often do we think about, oh, I wonder if this is going to turn into an insider threat? I would guess like never, right? And, but quite often it does. Quite often at least it moves into a person who's no longer engaged and, and that's going to become closer and closer to that insider threat situation, right? So these are all things to look for, conflict. I think we have a lot of work to do in organizations to actually mitigate conflict and make that, turn that into a more productive environment. But these are some of the things that we can look at. Of course, the bottom four groups, those are pretty obvious, right? So if there's criminal activity, if they're messing with back doors, if they're doing any of those things, like that's, that's a, you know, a huge red flag that, uh, that, that you should worry about. Send some indicators of compromise just for employees in general. Um, this is what I would take a look at. And, and this gets complicated, right? Because you don't want to create a witch hunt. You don't want people going, oh, yeah, I saw Joe over there doing something bad. I'm going to report him. Um, so you have to be very careful with how you use this. And this is not exhaustive, of course. There's, there's many more. But these are some of the key things that you want to watch for. And your company is going to, um, depending on the culture, you're, it's going to depend on how you want to have that reported. So then finally, how do you respond now that you, you, you know, once you have something going on in your organization, uh, what are you going to do there? So hopefully you have something already written down. You have the uh, uh, insider threat as a component of your incident response plan. If it's not, you probably want it to be because the last thing you want to do is respond to, to that uh, kind of on the fly and improvise. Uh, I remember my first interaction with law enforcement in a corporate environment was uh, we, we had to report something and we had a, uh, a, a, a police officer come in from the street with the street clothes on, like the, the, the 40 pound vest and everything like that, and had no idea what I was talking about. It became immediately apparent. And uh, yeah, he was super confused and it was just strange. So you don't want that scenario. You can learn from me. Um, Understand what you're dealing with, right? So this could become a legal issue fairly quickly, especially if you make a mistake. So do you fully understand? Oh, I'm sorry. You should have told me. I was, I was just reading the wrong slide here. 
I'm sorry. Um, so yeah, so, so you want to fully understand what you're dealing with here, right? Because this could turn into a legal event. And if you jump the gun and, and, uh, and act on something prematurely, uh, it, it could be bad for you and the company, right? So you have to really understand what happened uh, and why. Um, responding based on evidence. So this is related to that. So you should have some good evidence on, on what's happened because this could very well go to court. Uh, many of these things do, especially if they're more, more serious, right? Uh, so make sure that you've got adequate evidence or at least access to that evidence and it's not going to be, going to be purged. Sometimes we have to be much more patient with these sort of things than we would like to be. Um, and, but this is one of the times where you, you really need to, be, need to be patient and monitor. Uh, also, this is really multi-department, right? When we start to get into these sort of things, it's not just information security. As much as we like to ice, we like to operate in isolation quite often, uh, this is something that you really need HR and legal to be working with you as a team. So if you're not already working with legal or HR, if you don't know the people in legal, if you have a legal team, uh, now's a good time to reach out to them and say, hey, what's what do we do for insider threat stuff? Like, do I talk to you and what's that look like? And, and get in front of that. I think that that's... Um, Having that knowledge of what the process is going to look like before it happens is, is, is a great idea. And then as well, local law enforcement. So don't do what I did and have that beat cop off the street come in and try to help you because it's not going to go well and it's going to waste a lot of time. What you want to try to do, especially if you're a medium to large size organization, is have a, a monthly call maybe. Uh, if you're not getting threat intel from them already, some countries like uh, Canada, we get threat intel from our uh, agency. If you're not getting that, if you don't have that uh, monthly meeting with them, good time to set it up. Even if you're not huge as far as a company, depending on the sector that you're in, uh, you may get special attention, right? So it's quite often worthwhile to at least reach out, get signed up for that, make a contact there. Um, even if, it's, if you're in a small town, small company, then just talk to the local law enforcement and start getting that network built up, right? so that when this does happen, you're uh, ready to go. Um, yeah, and then response should be continual, right? So there's serious uh, uh, things that happen here with when they're stealing your IP, but then there's also the other side of it where it, with the pawns, we don't really view that as that serious, right? If someone's burning all the IP before they leave your company, is that okay? I don't think it is, right? Um, it makes your competitors better off because now they have a lot of your data. So it really shouldn't be allowed, yet quite often we allow it just because, oh, well, you know, Sam's a good guy and, you know, he's going to go get a new job. And, and so quite often that's permitted, um, which I don't think it should be, right? But if you let it, then it's just going to progress. So finally, what's our, our strategy? So this is something you can, uh, hopefully I can leave with you that's gonna help you to develop that insider threat strategy and, uh, and something you can kind of directly take to your company and, and hopefully apply in, in some form. So the first one is how do we respond and that continual response, right? Lack of response is just going to encourage that. If people know, oh, there's no penalty, so I can take all this data or I can do all these things and no one's gonna get upset with me or I'm not going to get fired, then it's going to just get worse. Start easy. So I went through all the different layers of insider threat, all the different types, all the different ways that you can, uh, the different training that you can do and things like that. Training is fairly easy, right? You can develop your own, you can go out and buy some, uh, but it's fairly straightforward to then go and apply. It's fairly low risk. You start getting into phishing programs and stuff like that. It gets a little bit more, more uh, uh, difficult. But um, still, I mean, that for bang for your buck, that's going to be one of the easier things to, to implement, right? So start easy. Why not, right? Um, that's going to take care of a lot of your pawns and even some of your turn cloaks, right? But then the custom approach for the different types, I would recommend, of course, education for the pawns can be effective. Make it fun. Don't make it boring. If it's just click through stuff, it is not going to be effective. And then the company culture for turn cloaks. Taking a look at engagement level. So do you do an engagement survey in your company? Do you know what that engagement level is like? When people don't get a promotion, when they get some sort of disappointment, they don't get a raise and things like that, what does your company do? I know this is not information security that I'm talking about right now so much, but it leads leads to that. It makes it our job later on, right? If, the, if HR is not doing theirs, 
it comes to us eventually because then they throw in some ransomware and now it's our problem. One of the things I, I really don't like is when something becomes my problem, right? And that often it, it, it's hard to see sometimes, but this is what happens. And so looking at the company culture and understanding uh, what's happening there within the organization, I think is super high value for people like us that are in information security and, and that can actually add our input into this, right? And, and explain to the company that, and especially the leadership, that, hey, if you do this over here, it's gonna mean that over there, and that's gonna cost you a lot of money. So if you spend a dollar over here, it's gonna save you a hundred over there. And showing them that linkage I think it's going to help the company a lot. And um, yeah, so that's what I would recommend there. And then for imposters, uh, really that holistic mix of technical and behavioral controls put into place, right? So when you're really bringing those together, somehow monitoring behavioral changes within the employee base. So are they trying to access the data closet repetitively? Are they working very late? So if you're able to build profiles based on that behavioral activity and then combine that with technical controls so you can see that they're trying to log into those servers that they, they have no need to log into or why did they just put three terabytes over there and it's just sitting there for a month right which is quite often a, a strategy that they will do because it's fairly benign and fairly innocent however it allows them to kind of test the waters can they move the data right and then collaborating early, and another huge thing that I often advocate is, do you have strong partnerships with HR, with legal, with all these entities that you're going to need in a hurry once bad things happen? And this would be bad, right? So that's, uh, yeah, that's your, your one-pager strategy there. And, and failing to take action, right, really makes you, and I heard this quote somewhere before, I'm going to paraphrase, but... It makes you this free arm of R&D to all these companies out there that will just simply take your data, right? And it's really sad to see that. And I see it so often, and I don't see us getting better at this. So hopefully this makes us a little bit better. Hopefully there was something there that you can take away and apply to your company uh, to make you a little bit more safe and, uh, and reduce this overall.